السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله وبركاته. Hey, you've tuned into Inspire FM and you're listening to the Quranic Reflections show uh, with your host Amar Faz and I'm here with Sheikh Nuruddin Rashid today. Inshallah today uh, we're going to be addressing a topic uh, titled the danger of a literal knowledge mm. and we can relate it to the to the old saying which some of us may have heard is that a little knowledge is a dangerous thing um, and uh, and how we should and how we should take to to people who don't have sufficient knowledge in some areas what we can do to recognize if we have insufficient knowledge in some areas and what we can and what the best way is to overcome this as well mm. So inshallah with that I'd like to hand it over to Sheikh Nuruddin mm-hmm. Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Rabbi yassir wa in wa barik ya ar-Rahman ar-Rahimin. <coughs> we'll begin with a hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This hadith is narrated in many books, hadith collections amongst them. Uh, the collection of Abu Ya'ala in Bazar, in Tabarani, Ibn Majah and others besides. The hadith is considered a strong hadith, a Hassan hadith, Hassan li ghayrihi. And uh, the wording I'm going to narrate is from uh, the collection of Abu Ya'ala. We narrated that the Prophet said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيضَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمٌ Which translates as, Seeking knowledge is an obligation on every single Muslim. So, <clears throat> the point is, as Muslims, just like we're obliged to pray five times a day, obliged to fast in the month of Ramadan, obliged to pay, pay zakah, and you know the various obligations we have in Islam, this is also an obligation upon us. And unfortunately, in my experience, this is um, rarely recognized as an obligation. Many people, Muslims, they have, even if they're, you know, kind of uh, religious-minded Muslim or more devout Muslims, they don't have this appreciation that seeking knowledge is an a- actually an obligation. It's not a recommendation. It's not something you do if you find the time, you know, you do it. No, rather, just like prayer is obligatory, you must find the time for it. Mm. It's not something that, uh, if it, you know, incidental. If it works out, it works out. And if it doesn't, it, you know, you don't do it. No, just like the prayer, we're obliged to make time for it. We are obliged to make time for uh, the study of Islam. And as I said, many people, uh, they seem to have this understanding that, you know, it's not a fundamental requirement as a Muslim. Mm. Um, or they have this understanding that, you know, learning Islam or the deen in a lot of detail, this is something that ulama do. You know, this mm. is not the oblig- this is not required of every Muslim. Which this kind of understanding it contradicts the explicit words of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet said, طَلَبُ الْعِلْمِ فَرِيدَةٌ عَلَى كُلِّ مُسْلِمْ Upon every Muslim. It's obligatory to seek knowledge upon every Muslim. Now, obviously we don't say that every Muslim has to become a scholar. It's mm. not the case. The ulama they commented on this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu and they said, with regards to this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, this doesn't uh, in- include all aspects of knowledge. There are certain knowledges which are obligatory upon a person uh, or upon a Muslim to study. And uh, those knowledges which a person cannot correctly worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without an understanding and appreciation of them. And <clears throat> many scholars listed them out as the following. They said, the, the science of aqidah, or a theology, Islamic creed or belief, uh, is an obligation. Why? Because without studying our belief system, we're not going to uh, understand all of the various things that we must believe in as Muslims. The Prophet ﷺ gave us an overview of it in the Hadith Jibreel, mm-hmm. the Sahih Hadith, where the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that you must believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in his books, in his messengers, in his angels, in the afterlife and in uh, divine decree, kind of gave us an overview of it. Mm. These kind of things we study in detail and we study in detail in the science of aqidah. Mm. We also have as an obligation <coughs> in the science of fiqh. Mm. Fiqh is basically the study of Islamic law, rules and regulations, the sacred law that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed. Sure. And it's quite broad. 
it's not just simply studying uh, wudu and purity and tahara and ghusl and these kind of things and prayer and zakah and hajj and fasting it expands beyond that the fiqh of trade this is um, you know part of what we're required to study buying and selling and what's halal and what's haram and what's <coughs> considered prohibited in terms of financial transaction what's the definition of usury or interest and these kind of things and these are important for a person to study it's mm. important for anybody about to embark upon marriage to understand all of the related rules and regulations and the laws of inheritance are important for people to have an appreciation of so they don't make mistakes with regards to it so Islamic law is broad and it covers every aspect of our life and unless we know the sacred law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we can't um, we can't actually obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in any, any. And this, uh, I'm going off on a slight tangent I didn't initially intend to speak about this but it's important to clarify this point many Muslims they have this understanding that if you don't know you're somehow excused mm. Mm. And I've heard people in the past, you know, I may say to them, look, why don't you attend classes? Why don't you uh, study the deen? They say, look, at the moment I don't know. So if I don't know, and I don't, you know, if I don't act on certain things, then I'm not accountable for it. Mm -hmm. But if I go and I study and I don't act upon what I've learned, then I'm going to be accountable for it, which mm -hmm. is completely incorrect. And it contradicts this hadith, contradicts many others besides, and it contradicts very clearly what the ulama have said. The ulama have said these are two obligations. One obligation is to study mm -hmm. and to learn, and a second obligation is to act upon that knowledge. Somebody who hasn't studied and therefore cannot act upon it, doesn't know what's obligatory, doesn't know what's prohibited, uh -huh. so can't act upon the sacred law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This person has uh, failed twice. Right failed in his or her obligation to learn in the first place yeah. and then failed in his or her obligation to observe the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala okay. as for the one who does study yeah. but does not act upon their knowledge is still in a very bad position now we have right. many hadith of the Prophet that warn against such things sure. uh, I'm not saying whatsoever this person is fine or in a good position still in a bad position mm. but this person has one failing not two right. this person has at least learnt what the Quran and hadith are teaching us Okay, but has failed in acting upon that knowledge. This is a misconception that people have. And again, the second person, the second person I mentioned, is not in a good situation by not acting upon their knowledge, but at least they give themselves a chance. You see, if you know what's right and wrong, there's a possibility you're going to do what's right and you're going to avoid what's wrong. But you've got no idea in the first place what is right and what is wrong. You don't even give yourself a chance. So to give an example, backbiting, Backbiting, we know, or most Muslims know, back, uh, knows, that backbiting is haram, prohibited in Islam. Mm. But what is the definition of it? And if you don't understand the definition of backbiting, or if one doesn't understand the definition of backbiting, you cannot avoid it. Mm. You see, and people will say all kinds of things, um, justifying uh, what they're saying, and, and won't consider it to be backbiting, and it's in contradiction to the actual definition of backbiting. So, for example, um, you know, at times somebody may uh, say something negative against another, mm. and you may pull this person up and say, um, you know, this, uh, this, you're not allowed to say this. This is prohibited. This is considered backbiting. And he'll answer uh, by saying something along the lines of either, well, I'm willing to say it in front of his face, right. yeah, or uh, sometimes, but it's true. Mm. And especially the second response, but it's true, is in direct contradiction to the definition set by the Prophet ﷺ of backbiting. We have hadith in Sahih Muslim mm. where the Prophet ﷺ spoke about backbiting. And uh, the Prophet ﷺ said it's to mention something about your brother that, uh, that he would dislike. And anything mm. a person is going to dislike, you mention it with regards to them. Behind their back, it's considered backbiting. Then the Sahaba actually asked, in this hadith, the Sahaba asked, they said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, what if it's true? And the Prophet ﷺ said, if it's true, it's backbiting. It's riba, backbiting. And if it's false, then it's buhtan, slander, which is a greater sin. Right. Because yeah, that mixes between backbiting and lying. So the point is, the actual definition the Prophet ﷺ gave with regards to backbiting is when you're speaking the truth about a person, 
uh, behind their back and it, it's going to upset them. It's going to, you know, they find it harmful, they find it upsetting. So, uh, as I said, unless you have th this type of knowledge with regards to all aspects of Islam, you don't give yourself a chance. A person is going to, you know, might be saying negative things about others behind their back and keeps telling himself, well, it's okay because it's true. It's okay because it's true. Mm -hmm. It's not okay. It's actually yeah. the exact definition of backbiting. So, uh, you know, this is very important to bear in mind and to understand that this, understa uh, this uh, attitude that many Muslims have, mm -hmm. that if you don't know, you're somehow not responsible. No, this is completely incorrect. And the ulama have actually said the opposite. They said if somebody doesn't have knowledge and... <coughs> Uh, doesn't have knowledge therefore doesn't act upon the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's committed a double sin lacking knowledge of something which is obligatory to know and also not acting upon the law of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so to return other obligatory knowledges that the scholars have mentioned uh, some scholars or many scholars have included tazkiyah or uh, as it's called in, in hadith ihsan this is you know one of the sciences of Islam often called tazkiyah or ihsan as other names besides, which deals with a number of things. Yani you could say generally deals with uh, things, uh, yani, uh, more spiritual matters. So Islamic spirituality is sometimes how it's translated. Um, this is aspects of that are considered uh, obligatory by many of our ulama. So this comes under those sciences which are obligatory for one to study. Um, and for those who can't recite Quran, without making errors which are most people mm. who are not of Arab origin usually people who are of Arab origin they can more or less recite the Quran without major mistakes in their right. tajweed in their recitation of the Quran they will if they haven't studied the science of tajweed they will almost invariably have minor mistakes no doubt about that but major mistakes as for people who you know haven't uh, are not of that kind of background uh, they will often have major mistakes in the recitation of the Quran. So many scholars have included this as the fourth obligatory knowledge, the science of Tajweed. Or to be more specific, uh, for one to study recitation of the Quran until a person eradicates their major mistakes. is considered obligatory. So these are, you know, many scholars, they mention these four sciences as being obligatory. The science of Aqidah, Islamic creed. The science of uh, fiqh or Islamic law, the science of uh, tazkiyah or ihsan, which is Islamic spirituality, and the science of tajweed or learning to eradicate major mistakes. As for other sciences, they are very noble and there's great rewards in them, mm -hmm. but they're not considered personal obligations. Right. So, for example, Arabic language, Arabic language, very beneficial, inshallah ta'ala, but it's not considered an obligatory science. Okay. Even noble sciences like tafsir of the Quran or study of hadith, these are considered very noble and there's great reward. Um, and you know, we would strongly encourage people to engage in them, these sciences, to study them. But it's not considered personally obligatory to do so. What's considered personally obligatory are those sciences that you need to function as a Muslim and to make sure you fulfill your obligations and you refrain from that which is prohibited which, I'm sorry for the long introduction, but which takes us to our subject matter today, having a little knowledge. Okay. The Prophet ﷺ told us, seeking knowledge, طلب العلم فريضة okay, that, you know, having uh, a good meaning that, you know, seeking this knowledge, out, having a good understanding of these things. Whereas what is often the case nowadays, people have superficial knowledge or sometimes even snippets of knowledge which uh, certainly does not fulfill the obligation we're speaking about, you know, to have a little bit of information here and a little bit of information there. And, you know, somebody's heard something here and somebody's heard something there. Mm. Uh, this in no way fulfills one's obligations and can actually uh, be harmful to a person. can actually lead to misunderstanding things. Because mm. if you've got a snippet of information but not the full picture, you're very much liable to misunderstand. And, uh, you know, let me quote a hadith of the Prophet wasallam, where this actually took place and the Prophet wasallam spoke very strongly uh, against the people involved in it. So this hadith is in uh, many different collections, Abu Dawood's 
uh, hadith collection Ibn Majah's and others besides. The narration I have is from Hakim, and it's a Sahih narration according to Imam Hakim, Imam Dhabi, rahimahullah ta'ala. And it speaks of <coughs> the fact that the Prophet وسلم, once uh, sent out a group of Sahaba, radiallahu mm-hmm. ta'ala anhum, on a military expedition. And <coughs> whilst they were there, whilst they were out, one of them got injured. In a military expedition, liable to get injured. So one of them got injured, had a head injury. And during the expedition, this person, the one with a head injury, he requ- he was required to make ghusl, okay, to take a ritual bath in, for, for, the, uh, for the purpose of purification. Mm. And he, he had a concern that he's got a head injury and it's cold and the water is also cold. And if he uses this cold water, he, f- you know, he feared that, you know, it might call, cause him more harm. And so he asked the, his companions, he asked the other Muslims who were with him, that, you know, do you think it's possible for me to perform tayammum? Or, you know, is there some other option for me rather than washing my entire body with this cold water? And they said to him, no, you have to, you have to wash your entire water, uh, your entire body with cold water. This is what they said to him. So he went ahead and done it. And what happened? This resulted in the injury opening up and getting worse. And he ended up dying as a result of it. When they got back to the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ heard what they had done, the Prophet ﷺ said these very strong words. The Prophet ﷺ said, okay. The Prophet ﷺ said, they killed him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala kill them. Is not the cure of ignorance questioning. So the point is, did they did these people have some knowledge? Yes, they had some knowledge. Okay. Mm-hmm. They knew that um, a person who uh, you know is in a state of what we call janab, a major ritual impurity, this person has to make also. They had that knowledge. Okay. But you know, it's kind of a snippet of information. They had a little bit of information. They didn't have the full picture. So this is why, based on that little bit of information, they advised him that he should go ahead and he should make the wusl. But they didn't have the full picture. They didn't know that if a person is going to endanger his well-being, jeopardize his well-being, then no, in such a case, a person shouldn't go ahead and behave in, uh, or do perform ghusl the way the Sahabi performed the ghusl. Rather, this is actually not permitted to do so. As you have uh, in another hadith of the Prophet ﷺ with another Sahabi, this time uh, 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 sorry, Amr ibn al-As, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, it's uh, mentioned the Prophet ﷺ once sent him out on a military expedition and... He wasn't injured, as the narration doesn't mention he was injured. But what happened? One morning, he woke up, and since he was the leader of the military expedition, he was to lead the prayers as well. Mm-hmm. So he woke up one morning, and he required he was in major ritual impurity. He required a ghusl. He required a ritual bath. Mm-hmm. But it was very cold. And to take a bath in this cold, is, you know, he felt he's going to jeopardize his well-being. So he did perform tayammum. Uh, those of our listeners who aren't aware of what tayammum is, I'll just give a very brief explanation. No, no, I can't go into great detail uh, at the moment. But a tayammum is when a person, instead of making wudu or ghusl um, with water, if there's a good reason, a person, instead of doing so, can transfer over to making what we call dry ablution. This is what tayammum is, which means using sand or soil to perform a particular ritual in which one uh, wipes one's face and wipes one's arms and this takes the place of ghusl or wudu if there's a genuine need it can't be done normally there has to be a genuine need anyway he made this uh, he decided to do so and he made tayammum instead mm-hmm. and he led the prayer they prayed behind him because he was their leader and the prophet sallallahu always told people to obey their leaders and but they were unhappy about it when they went back to the Prophet ﷺ, and they informed the Prophet ﷺ of what this person done, that he required ghusl, but he just made tayammum and he led the prayer for everybody. The Prophet ﷺ questioned him, why did you do so? And he said, well, he said, O Messenger of Allah, because it was very cold, and I feared for my well-being if I use cold water to make ghusl. 
and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, says in the Holy Quran and do not cast yourselves into destruction with your own hands mm. so he quoted a verse of the Quran to the Prophet also, and the Prophet accepted his explanation right. the point is <coughs> um, this group of Sahaba going back to the original hadith they had a little bit of information okay? mm. and they acted upon that little bit of information and somebody might say well that's okay because they you know, they just acted upon what they knew. It's not okay. Not might be okay according in some people's minds, but it's not okay according to our Prophet Sallallahu What did he say? Qataluhu qatalahumullah. They killed him by advising him to make tayammum, even though he had a head. Uh, sorry, make wasl, even though he had a head injury. They actually killed him. The mm. Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. You know, he used these very strong words. So the point is, it's not sufficient and it's not enough to have little snippets of information and then pass these on to other people or to give people fatwa if you like you know that this is allowed and this is correct and this is haram or what have you without having a full understanding it is very important to have a fuller understanding and not uh, you know very superficial knowledge mm. yeah. and this kind of brings me on to another point I wanted to speak about as well uh, regarding obtaining this knowledge uh, that we mentioned the obligatory knowledge I mean <coughs> what's the best way of doing so can somebody do this through means like YouTube or other social media mm. outlets as well yeah this is a very good question and kind of uh, links to another question is what is sufficient knowledge and how, yeah. do we, how do we gain sufficient knowledge because here these people they heard the statement of the Prophet yes. which is one of the most Mubarak forms of knowledge together with the Holy Quran um, but it still wasn't sufficient. so what is sufficient knowledge here Alhamdulillah from the earliest times of our Ummah in our Islamic tradition scholars have put together uh, a books what they tend to call in Islamic terminology mutun, basic books that give you a broad understanding of what's required for one to know so you know how should uh, how should one study one should study any for example in fiqh one should take a uh, a basic text in fiqh a well-known authoritative recognized book in fiqh and to study it with a teacher from beginning to end mm -hmm. and so for example if one is studying the subject of tahara it will go into a lot of detail. So it will speak about, for example, wudu and when is wudu obligatory, when is it not obligatory, uh, exactly what uh, what's required to make the wudu sound, the ritual ablution sound, and what's considered um, you know, not obligatory but recommended within the wudu. Speak about those kind of things which actually prevent the wudu being valid, like having you know, some kind of barrier on the skill or nail varnish or paint on the hands. So go into these kind of details. It will speak about the various things that invalidate the wudu. Mm -hmm. So the point, they'll give you, uh, give one a holistic understanding. Then sure. it will speak about usul. Then it will speak about uh, tayammum, which we just touched upon. Then it will speak about impurities. And the point is it will take the subject matter and it will detail it out and it will attempt. this uh, Books like this, they will attempt to give you a broad understanding you see all of the basics you need to know with regards to it this will be imparted inshallah to the student and this as I said has you know been part of our tradition from the earliest of times where scholars have attempted to write these basic books mm -hmm. for uh, non-specialists meaning non-scholars to give them a broad understanding so how to fulfill this obligation to go out and study these mutun and each of the Islamic sciences they have their mutun in fiqh we have uh, famous mutun, in aqidah we have famous texts, in ihsan or tazkiyah we have famous texts, in tajweed we spoke about these, in the various sciences we have all of these. So that's the correct way of doing things, you see, to identify books which are considered authoritative and to study them with people of knowledge, insha'Allah ta'ala. That's the correct way of fulfilling this obligation. As for, uh, you know, watching clips on YouTube, Mm -hmm. or, or videos or what have you or other uh, other means there's a place for them and inshallah ta'ala they can be beneficial okay? but they should be used for or understood and uh, uh, utilized for what they are right. often what you find on them are you know, mo uh, you know things which are used for motivation 
Mm -hmm. basically a, a brief speech or what have you or a few words of encouragement or what have you that kind of thing is fine but to understand or they might you know give you a brief understanding regarding a very limited sorry one aspect of a broader subject matter you see a video on um, say for example uh, the importance of salah you mm. see a brief video on zakah you know a brief video on the holy quran or the prophet sallallahu give you little mm. snippets of information it's fine okay but that's fine you can benefit from that information but that must be coupled with a serious study if that yeah. becomes one's sole means of becoming educated in the deen it's not going to be sufficient and as we spoke about people are going to have superficial knowledge and snippets of information which are actually going to may actually be more harmful than good so there's good in in these sources uh, there's a, a great deal of there is a great deal of benefit therein inshallah ta'ala but they should not be used as a substitute okay. that will uh, end for a short break and we'll be back inshallah